Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel High Church. I'm so happy that you've joined us in spirit from wherever you are this morning for a time of worship. I'd like to give a special welcome to anyone who might be joining for the first time this morning and a thank you to Karen Foster for being our liturgist. Today is Sunday, August 23rd, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost and our 23rd Sunday of worshiping at home. Uh, I'll be on vacation starting tomorrow visiting my son in Philadelphia, but worship will still be held via Zoom um, next Sunday um, with special leadership from our association. Um, movie night was so successful that we are going to hold a second movie night on September 25th. Um, we will be watching Remember the Titans. So I hope you will join us for our next drive-in movie. It, it um, looks like it will be much earlier, 7.30, which is good news as it continues to get darker as we approach the fall. And now for a few housekeeping rules. Um, as always, your microphones are muted to cut down on confusion, but we still ask that you use your voice to participate in this morning's worship. Next, someplace on your screen, you'll find a chat box. If you click to open it, that's where you can type any prayer requests or anything that you would like um, the church to know. At lesson time, we have been reading out of our own Bibles, so I hope you have taken a moment to fetch your Bible and a candle to light. If you haven't already done that, um, I hope you'll do that right now. Our scripture reading this morning are Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 14, verse 22, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Our hymns are Long Ago When Pharaoh's Daughter, sung to Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. After the service, you're welcome to grab a cup of coffee and hang out for coffee hour and chat and catch up. We'll unmute everyone's mic at that time. And now let's move into a time of worship. As we do each week, let's place our right hand on our hearts and our left hand on our bellies. And just breathe, just breathe. Breathe in to the count of four and out to a count of more than four. Breathing in the presence of God and breathing out any stress or anxiety we might be feeling. Taking another breath in. And breathing out, releasing any leftover worry. We remember that no matter where we are, that God is with us, ever drawing us near to the spirit of oneness and love. If you have a candle, Take a moment to light it as I light the candles here on our altar. The flame of the candle represents the light of Christ and reminds us that Christ as the Holy Spirit is always with us and within us. And the candle also reminds us that regardless of what we were doing just minutes ago, we've now entered into a sacred time. We're never truly alone. Christ is here now as we worship and always in our hearts. Let's pray, shall we? As we gather this day, O oh Lord, some of us, in our own homes and some of us far away. We know that you too are seeking us. Help us 
to be attentive to your word and feel your presence in this time of worship. Amen. And let's take a moment now and join in our singing of our introit as we step into holy ground. Join me in the call to worship. Holy One, our contractions are minutes apart. You stretch out your hand, you deliver. You coach us through pain as the pangs of birth make way for something new. You stretch out your hand and you deliver. Push, you say, as your new creation appears. You stretch out your hand. You deliver. Let us pray. Creator God, be with us as like a skilled midwife. The pain is too much to bear. Our world has so much discord that your renewal seems impossible. Fears of economic uncertainty confront us all and seem to limit our choices. Fears of immigrants and strangers in our midst seem to require walls. Fears about changing traditions seem to require new ways of expressions. We lament, Holy One, but we don't push through the fear. Let us open ourselves to labor with you. Be with us as our midwife. Push us to labor in your love as we create with you a better world. Amen.
The God of Moses and Miriam makes a way for you. God holds our hand and insists upon life. You are a channel of God's love now and always. Praise be to the God of life who is now and forever. Amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been setting aside a few minutes each week during our worship time to learn more about our Bibles from the Bible Project folks. This week, we learn about part one of the book of Exodus. Let's watch. Let's talk about the book of Exodus. Now, you're probably familiar with this book because of the epic story of Moses leading Israel out of slavery from Egypt. Yeah, but that's just the first half of the book. And the second half has Moses giving the Ten Commandments to Israel along with these blueprints for making a sacred tent. Now, right here in the middle is the story that connects these two halves together, and it all takes place at the foot of a famous mountain. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. So the first thing we have to remember is we're continuing the story from Genesis. Yeah, in Genesis, God promised Abraham that through his family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Genesis ends with Abraham's family down in Egypt. When Exodus begins, 400 years have passed, the family grows and becomes the people group now called Israel. But there's this huge problem because the Israelites are enslaved to this king of the Egyptians, a guy called Pharaoh. This guy is really bad news. Yeah, he's horrible. He, he disregards their humanity. He brutally enslaves them. And he even orders that all of the Israelites' sons should be killed by throwing them into the Nile River. He wants to wipe these people out. He's the worst character in the Bible so far. Here's where we meet an Israelite woman who wants to save her son. And so she does throw him in the river, but safely in this little reed basket. And Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby and takes him as her own. And this is the boy who grows up to become Moses, the man who will rescue Israel from slavery. So Moses grows up and one day, much later in his life, he has this crazy encounter with God where he comes across a bush that's on fire, but it isn't actually burning up. And God speaks from the bush and he appoints Moses as the man he will use to deliver Israel. So Moses goes to Pharaoh to tell him this, this news that God wants his people free. And Pharaoh, he just pretty much laughs at him. <laughs> he's like, Who, who's this God Yahweh? And in fact, he's so offended by this request, he decides to make the Israelites work even harder. So discouraged, Moses goes back to God and says, listen, this plan's not going to work. But God repeats his promise that he's going to rescue them. And in fact, it's right here for the first time in the Bible that we hear the word redemption. It literally just means to purchase a slave's freedom. But God here uses this word to describe what he's going to do for enslaved Israel. And God knows Pharaoh is going to resist. So he sends 10 different plagues, one after another, like turning water into blood, sending all sorts of pests and disease. These plagues are really severe. They are severe, but we need to understand that the story is presenting these as acts of divine justice against one of the worst oppressors in the story of the Bible. And they're all aimed at the purpose of rescuing these enslaved people and defeating the gods of Egypt. This all comes to a climax at the 10th plague, where God's going to kill the firstborn sons across all Egypt. Every house, it's pretty rough. It is, but it's also God's response for how Pharaoh killed the Israelite sons. Now, as you turn the page, you suddenly get two long chapters of detailed instructions for what's essentially throwing a dinner party with a recipe for a lamb. Yeah, but this lamb is super important. God tells the Israelites to pick it out and to prepare it to be eaten. And they're supposed to take its blood and then paint it all over the doorframe of their house. And anyone who is in that house will be spared from this final plague. And so this meal, which is called Passover, it commemorates this key moment in the story where God brings his justice on human and evil, but also shows mercy by providing this substitute. This final plague makes Pharaoh angry and he demands that Israel gets out of Egypt, which is great. But suddenly as they leave, Pharaoh changes his mind. He has a change of heart. But on top of that, we're also told that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Why would God do that? 
Well, what we need to remember is that over and over in this story, Pharaoh has already chosen to harden his own heart. And so at this point, Pharaoh, he's not just evil, he's become monstrously evil. Even his own advisors think that he has gone way too far. And so how is God supposed to deal with such an extreme form of evil? And what we see in this story is that God uses his power to lure evil into its own destruction. Pharaoh and his army are destroyed in the Red Sea as Israel passes into freedom. And after this, we find the very first song of worship in the Bible, as the people praise God for redeeming them. And it's in this story that the word salvation is also used for the first time, which means simply to be rescued from danger. Now that they're saved, you would think that everything should be great, but the story quickly turns. The Israelites start wandering in the desert. They're tired, hungry, lost. And you start to wonder, what's God doing? What were they saved for? And we learn the answer to that question in the very next story, which ties the two parts of this whole book together. Our first lesson is from the book of Romans. I think Karen is going to read it. I think Karen's having it. Internet problems. Sorry, I'm, Karen's having internet problems. Okay, our first lesson this morning is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. Listen as the Spirit speaks chapter to our 12, Verses 1 through 8. To you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your Okay, Karen, I do think you're having internet problems. Uh, I will read it here. I appeal, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your minds, so that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. May God bless the reading and hearing through his holy word. Testament lesson comes from the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 8, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 through chapter 2, verse 10. Our lesson picks up some 
400 years after the time of Joseph. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join with our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tests on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get a nurse from a, the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. The Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word for all God's people. May God bless all who keep it, who hear it, and who share it. Let's pray. Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and to know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you today, now, and always. This morning, I'd like to share a sermon with you um, that's a famous reflection from the Reverend Dr. Anna Carter Florence entitled The Girls in the Reeds. It was written many years ago, and it sounds a little bit like an episode from Little House on the Prairie but it's even more relevant today than it was the day that she wrote it. Let's listen. What a perfect story. Pharaoh makes chaos, mother makes ark. Princess finds baby, sister brokers deal. 
baby saved, barrel foiled. A perfect story and a great, great role for girls, I might add. Not quite the Bible meets Frozen, but almost. So before we get into it, I want you to notice two things. First, is that the main characters are young people and their parents aren't around. That's important because this story is about what happens when the young people are in charge. The second is that without this story, without these two girls in the reeds, there is no Moses, there is no Exodus, there's no liberation for the people of God, and there won't be unless the parents get off the stage and the young people set things in motion. So you've got your two stock roles here, beautiful princess and responsible big sister. And they're both good parts. Even for you guys who are listening out there, just use your imagination. You can be the Pharaoh's daughter clad in silks and dipping your lovely toes in the cool green water. Or you can be Moses' sister, alone in the reeds, keeping watch over the basket by day and night. You can be the powerful princess or the smart, resourceful sister. Like I said, you can't lose. They're both strong characters. And while the text doesn't tell us exactly how old they were, whether they were teenagers or 20-somethings or maybe even younger, what it does tell us is each of them had an inner radical just waiting to be unleashed. Each of them was ready to set aside what she should do and work together on what they might do, which is what happens when you're down in the reeds. I want to walk you through some of this story with you. It's familiar, but you know how scripture is. You hear it differently over time. So let's read it today the way the girls in the story lived it, as if the parents weren't around, which is an interesting interpretive lens, come to think of it. Read scripture as if your parents aren't around. A lot of people could stand to do that. So you know the context. We're in Egypt, a world of uh, a world superpower in those days, and the Hebrews are the Egyptians' slaves. But the Hebrew population is growing. It's big enough to make Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, feel threatened and worried that soon these people will be almost as numerous as his own. You'll go downtown and you'll hear Hebrew as much as you hear Egyptian. So Pharaoh comes up with a highly effective and unspeakably evil plan to control them. He targets the boys. Every Hebrew boy baby that is born, Pharaoh orders all the Egyptian citizens, they should exterminate the boys on site, pitch them in the Nile. Pharaoh knows, target the boys of the people you want to dominate and eventually you will destroy them. Moses, of course, was a boy. And so his mother did what she could. She hid him for a while, but babies grow. And when she couldn't hide him anymore, we read in verse three, Moses' mother, this daughter of Levi, does a priestly act. She takes a bunch of papyrus, she loans it with the ancient equivalent of Kevlar and makes a snug little art for her three-month-old son. It's a brilliant act. A symbolic act designed to save a life as well as to bear witness. And it's a heartbreakingly limited act. A Kevlar arc can't save a baby for too long. He has one day, maybe two, before he will die of exposure. One day, maybe two to live. And anyone who finds him will get the mother's message loud and clear. This is what we've come to in Egypt. Take a look, Kevlar cradles. It's all I could do for my child. It's all I could give him, just two more days. With that, the mother leaves the scene. 
Maybe she was like Hagar, who couldn't bear to watch baby Ishmael die in the desert. We don't know. But what we do know is that the sister takes over from here. That's what big sisters do. They watch when parents leave and they report back. It may be not what they choose to do, but it's their job as part of the family. It was the sister's job. Stand at a distance and see what happens to your brother. Be the girl in the reeds and then come home. Verse 5, enter the Pharaoh's daughter. But she had a different agenda. She came down to the river to take a bath. She came down to get away from it all. The court, the publicity, the pressure, the pedestal. Being beautiful is a tough job. But that's what princesses are. Everything we dream we could be. It's their job as part of the family. Today, this was the princess's job. Take your maid, go to the river, and get beautiful. Because we need you to look good for this afternoon. Be the girl in the reeds, and then come home. So here they are, two girls in the reeds. Two girls who know what they're supposed to do. Hide and watch, bathe and dress. Do as you're told and then come home. And they might have done it and never even met one another, but you know, the reeds are a watery, slippery, in-between kind of place. It's muddy and murky and hard to find your footing and who knows where the deep water starts. Anything can happen down in the reeds to upset your balance. And on this day, something did. You know what happened. The princess found the baby. The Egyptian princess found the Hebrew baby. You know what she was supposed to do with it. So did she. And so did the sister. So now what? What do you do with a baby in a basket when you're down in the reeds at the river's edge and the parents, your parents, are nowhere in sight? The parents knew what her father, the princess knew what her father would have done or at least what his law said must be done. If this was a Hebrew male child, and it was, she was supposed to tip it over, tip the basket over and let the baby just tumble into the water. At the very least, she was supposed to close the lid of the ark and just give it a little push and send it down down the river for somebody else to deal with. That's what the law said, like it or not. And she was supposed to uphold it. After all, she was the Pharaoh's daughter. The sister knew what the mother would have wanted too. If somebody found the baby, even if that somebody was an Egyptian, the sister was supposed to just keep watching as awful as things might get. She was supposed to stay in her hiding place so she wasn't seen and wasn't caught, and then report to her mother all that she saw happen. That's what times like these required, like it or not, and she was supposed to just try and survive. Two girls in the reeds with a little baby in between them. They knew what their parents would want them to do. And do you know what? They didn't do it. They couldn't. Things look different when you're down in the reeds. You have to think for yourself. Look for yourself. Tell it like you see it, which is what the princess did. This, she said, must be one of the Hebrews' children. Sometimes the truth is the most radical thing you can say. Just to name it, what you see right in front of you. That body left for hours in the street. That baby left to die in a basket. Say it out loud, letting it reverberate in the air. This, 
must be one of the Hebrews' children because no other mothers are reduced to this, making little arcs to float in the Nile trying to save their babies from a flood of hate. One truth then calls forth to another, especially when you're in the reeds. One girl stammering out the truth about what she sees invites another girl to speak up, too. One girl pausing over unspeakable evil encourages another one to stand with her. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, said the princess. And then the sister got an idea. Do you want me to find a nurse among the Hebrew women, she asked, stepping out of her hiding place. Do you want me to find someone to nurse that child for you? And just like that, they had a plan. A plan to save one life, no matter what their parents thought about it. And it was the craziest plan you could think of to take baby Moses back to his Hebrew mother for a few years and tell everyone it was just fine because it was on the Pharaoh's daughter's orders. Really, it was. But the girls did it, and they got away with it. And when Moses was three years old, the princess actually adopted him. She took him into the palace, and she raised him there with her father down the hall. And Lord only knows what she thought about the whole, what he thought about the whole arrangement. Little Moses sitting on his birth booster seat at the royal table, riding his Toys R Us chariot through the throne room. Scripture never says a word about that. But you see, this really isn't a story about the parents and doing what they told you, even if your dad is the Pharaoh. This story is about two young women doing whatever they could, whatever they could do together to help God get the bodies out of the reeds. So what does this, this tale then teach us? I don't think I'm overstating it to say that right now, we too are in the weeds. The shootings, the violence, they brought up all these things we haven't wanted to talk about for years. They have bubbled up all these things that we haven't wanted to talk about. Like why raci racism has such a grip on us and what we're going to do about all the guns. How should we treat our immigrants? And how on earth are we gonna have conversations about these things without shutting each other right down? What do you do when you're there in that muddy, slippery, in-between place down in the reeds? How do you keep listening, talking, and praying? Our lesson today has some things to say about that. What might happen if we bring these two girls to the streets where you and I live and ask them to show us some new ways to be? Maybe one of the first things they'd say is the thing that we've been picking up on through all this text. We don't have to see the world the same way our parents did. There will come a day when we're all down in the reeds and perhaps that day has already come and we have to decide for ourselves about what we're going to do about this situation, this interruption, this baby in a basket, this black boy laying on the street, this child with the deported father right here. That matters. And if the way we've been taught to see the world tells us that it doesn't matter, that we can turn and just walk away, well, then, then something has to change. And that something is us. And maybe the second thing that they'd say, these two girls, is that if you're down on the reeds and you don't know what to do next, well, start by telling the truth about what you see. Sometimes that is the most radical thing we can do. Just tell the truth about what we see, about the baby in front of us. This is one of the Hebrews' children. 
Say it. Say it out loud because one truth calls forth another and you never know who might be listening. You never know who may be waiting for their reason to come out from their hiding place to stand with you and make a plan to save one life. And maybe the third thing they'd say, these two girls, is that this is how liberation starts. God's liberating work starts down in the reeds with an interruption we didn't expect and a baby we have to acknowledge. God's liberation of a people can start with two girls and one really crazy idea. That's it. That's all you need. Because whenever the children of God claim the freedom to reimagine and remix the world, well, then Moses can grow up. The exodus out of slavery can begin. And I'll tell you what, we all need to get out of the reeds. It's the next chapter of God's story. And God is waiting for us to write it. And all God's people said, Amen. God has blessed us with an abundance of gifts. We are called to offer all that we are to God, our bodies, our spirits, our minds, our time, and our money. As the body of Christ, we are called to be in ministry with others. With true generosity, let us give of ourselves this morning. Please remember the church by sending your check or paying online through our Facebook page. Our prayer this morning comes from Sister Simone Campbell, founder of Nuns on the Bus. O Divine Spirit, during the weeks and months ahead, stir our hearts and our minds that we might fight for a vision that is worthy of you and your call to honor the dignity of all of your creation. A vision of who we are as a people grounded in community and care for all, especially the most marginalized. A vision that cares for our earth and heals our planet. A vision that ends structural racism, bigotry, sexism, so rife in our nation and in our history. A vision that ensures hungry people are fed, children are nourished, immigrants are welcomed. O oh, Spirit, breathe in us and our leaders a new resolve that committed to this new promise will work together to build a community grounded in healing, fearlessly based on truth and living out a sense of shared responsibility. In the name of all that is holy, O oh, Spirit, bring out of this time of global and national chaos a new creation a new community that can, with your help, realize your promise. Today, we especially remember before you, Veronica, Lauren Formant, Jerry, and Lisa. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Jim Cotton, 
family of Marge, the family of Mary Jo. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sadie, Alexandria, Christine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Carmen, family of Dick Goddard, Bud Warren. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Terry, Jan, Chris. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for Ralph. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With profound hope, we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus, all of this, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join with me in our closing hymn, O God, our help in ages past. And now let us go into the world as midwives of God's love. Let us remember we cannot do it alone. But even through the smallest acts of kindness, our God will deliver new life. Let us go in peace. Amen. <laughs>